You don't have to be a psychologist to question why people do bad or evil things, right? Trying to understand their motives. Maybe it's genetics, right? They were born that way. Or it was the environment or the circumstances they're in. Now, the reason I start out with that question is because at the root of the Milgram shock experiment was to try to understand why people partook in one of the greatest acts of evil that we've seen in recent memory. And that would be during World War II and the Holocaust, right? An act of genocide against the Jewish population of Europe. Now, I don't think anybody would argue that the Holocaust wasn't a terrible thing. I hope we can all be in agreement there. But what you can have a discussion on is the motives behind the German soldiers, right? Why they did what they did. Were they born evil? Did they just have this instinct toward others? Or is there something else at play? You see, after the Holocaust, when the German soldiers like Adolf Eichmann were arrested, they had time to respond and to say why they did what they did. And I'm going to paraphrase here, but this is from the Nuremberg trials. Eichmann and other generals said, essentially, I was just, what do you think he's going to say? I was just following orders, okay? And I want you to kind of dissect and digest what this is saying, right? He's basically saying, yes, I committed evil acts, but I bear no responsibility. That people above me were telling me what to do, and I'm an innocent person here, right? I was just obeying. And the reason the word obeying is important is because at the heart of the Milgram shock experiment is the idea of obedience, right? Listening to somebody and change your behavior because an authority figure is telling you to do so. Now, at the same time this is occurring, possibly a year after the Nuremberg trials, there's a psychologist at Yale University who has an interesting question. And his name, who's part of this study, of course, is Stanley Milgram, okay? Now, Stanley Milgram was Jewish himself, right? Which means he felt part of that. This is an emotional, right, discussion for him. Was, were the German soldiers really bad and evil? Or was it part of obedience and listening to authority figures? He would later write, and this would be part of his study, could it be that Eichmann and his million accomplices in the Holocaust were just, as we said before, following orders? And he wanted to know, can I recreate this question in a laboratory setting? So this is the root of the Milgram shock experiment. So let's dive into the study. There's three main people we need to know. And who are they? They are the experimenter, experimenter. Okay, they're kind of overseeing the study. We have the teacher, who's right here in the middle. And then what we have is the individual called the learner, the experimenter, the teacher, and the learner. Now, on the surface, it's rather a simple study. It's a study on learning and memory. You see, what the teacher does is they ask a bunch of questions, right? These are kind of word pair questions. And the learner is supposed to get the answer right. If they get it right, nothing happens. But if the learner gets the answer wrong, the teacher is going to press a button. There's going to be an electric shock that's going to go through the wall and provide a little electric shock to the learner. And hopefully, the learner will learn from their mistakes and they won't make so many mistakes there on out, right? That's kind of the simple study but there's more than meets the eye. You see, Milgram had a plan. Even though this seems like a very basic study, not everything as it seems. You see, the study actually started out with 40 males being recruited from the Yale University campus. And all those males come in and they pick out of a hat, right? They essentially pick straws. And they're gonna decide they are gonna be a teacher or a learner by picking out of straws. But here's the thing, it is rigged. No matter what they pick, they are always gonna be the teacher. So who are they gonna be? No matter what, the participant is always gonna be the teacher. So then the question is, who is this person they walked in? Because they definitely walked in with another person. Well, the learner is in on the study. They are part of the experiment, but the teacher doesn't know it, the participant doesn't know it. And just for our references, when you're part of a study, but you pretend, right, you're being deceitful, we call this a confederate. So the learner, is a confederate. Con All right, so now that we know there's some deceitfulness, here's really what the study is about. How far will the teacher go in causing harm or pain to the learner? Okay, now even though it's not real, we'll talk about that in a second, how far will he go? So obedience becomes what? Our dependent variable, always think about our research terms. So let's focus on this right here. This we call the shock generator shock box. Why is this important? Well, it's made to look real. It's got all the bells and whistles, but it doesn't actually work. And what you would see on this box is a few things. Uh, it would say something like 15 volts, 
okay? That's the lowest voltage, right? You might feel a little boop, a little electric shock, and it goes up by 15 increments, so 30 volts, 45 volts, and so on, all the way to 450 volts, X, X, X. And you see, as the learner gets answers wrong, what the teacher's supposed to do is flick a switch and get more power, more voltage, right? So if you get it wrong, 15 volts. You get it wrong again, 30 volts. And you keep going up and up and up, which will cause more pain, but will the teacher be obedient? Now, a couple other things. I want you to pay attention to the lab coat. That's important, right? In other words, you're an authority figure. And here's what happens. The teacher presses a button and there's electrocution, right? And the, the learner screams out loud, oh, this hurts, please stop, right? My, you know, I'll do a little heart symbol, right? My heart hurts. But guess what? It's a pre-recorded tape. There is no sound. All of it is fake. But the teacher believes that they are actually electrocuting the learner. Now the teacher's going to think, I can't do this. I am causing physical harm and emotional harm to my learner. I can't do this. So they turn to the experimenter. And the experimenter says a few things. They, th they say things like, I'll put it right here, uh, please continue. Please continue. Please continue. In other words, they're going to turn to the experimenter for help, right? I don't want to do this, but here's the experimenter saying, please continue. It's absolutely essential. And guess what? I will take responsibility, right? So you have this kind of conflict between obedience and personal and moral consciousness, right? Are, am I going to obey an authority figure, but it's at the will of my own morals and what I feel like to be a good person, right? This essentially is our study. All right, so what did Milgram find, right, as we kind of go up and up in our shock uh, generator? What Milgram found is that roughly, and this is a huge number, 65% of participants, two-thirds of participants, went up to the full max of 450 volts, okay? And 100% went up to 300 volts, right? That means two-thirds went to the highest voltage where they're knowing they're causing harm, at least they think they do. They think they're causing harm, they think they're causing emotional distress to the point where the learner doesn't even say anything anymore, like they're dead. The power of obedience. Another finding, there was definitely emotional distress, right? Emotional distress on the participant, distress right? They felt bad, right? They felt bad that they were harming the learner. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us a couple things. It definitely tells us about the power of the situation, right? The power of the group, right? That you can be a really good person like yourself watching. You could be an ordinary person, but can the situation make you do things that go against your moral compass, right? And what Milgram found is that it could. I think another interpretation, and we always come back to this, is nature nurture, right? Are we born evil? Can evil be learned or taught? So I think this is a nice discussion of nature versus nurture. Now, any criticisms of this? There's a lot of criticisms. One is ethics, right? This wasn't necessarily a wonderful ethical study, right? Essentially what we're doing is we're causing harm to people and part of the IRB is do no harm, right? We don't wanna harm our participants. Uh, and that's another ethical issue is, and there's some re uh, people believe this, is that there was some coercion. In other words, the teacher electrocuted the learner, not just because the experiment said, please continue, but they forced them to. So there is some research on that as well. And another one is, was there debriefing, right? After the study was over, did we talk to the teacher, the real person in the study and say, are you okay? Like, do you need help, emotional support? So maybe lack of debriefing as well. All right, any other criticisms? One, as I said before, remember, everybody in the study was men, right? Would the study be different? Would the outcome be different if it was women? Maybe. And the last one is what I'm gonna say is replication. You see, the study was replicated many times, okay? And yielded different results, right? If I take away the, the lab coat, would that change the outcome? It does, the white lab coat signifies authority and you might follow more along. Or what if we take away this wall? Does proximity matter? It does. If you take away the wall, you may be less likely to electrocute because you see the person, right? So there's some criticism there as well. So replication plays a big role. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I really hope you learned something. And I want you to think about this. If you were part of Milgram study, would you do the same thing? Would you throw out your morals and your conscience to obey authority figures? Just a thought. I'll see you next time.